Welcome everybody and thank you for joining my session. My name is Paweł Rzepa and today I'm going to talk about non-obvious methods of attacking and penetrating the AWS cloud. I want to share my research how an attacker can get initial access to your cloud even if you don't have any publicly exposed resources. And why I think that another cloud version of SolarWinds attack is just a matter of time. I will also show you my recent observations regarding IEM roles and how it can be used to escalate privileges. Finally, I'll show you a method of exfiltrating data uh, which is by default not logged by any monitoring service like VPC flow logs or CloudTrail and what is more important, I'll show you how to protect from such attacks. Does it sound interesting? If so, let's get started. Before starting my presentation, uh, please let me introduce myself. So I work as a senior ethical hacker in SoftServe and also I'm giving AWS trainings as AWS authorized instructor. Beyond that, I like to break stuff in cloud and the results of this work uh, you can and the results can be found on my uh, medium blog if you want to stay in touch i encourage you to follow me on twitter as well as you can find me on linkedin all right before going to those non-obvious methods let me clarify what i think is the uh, obvious methods of breaking into the cloud or rather which is what is the commonly known method of breaking into the cloud. So the first uh, that comes to my mind is the compromised keys. In other words, um, a developer, for example, is committing uh, the AWS access keys um, to the public repository or um, the, the repository in which those keys were committed is, for example, forked to the, from the private to public repository, then the attacker is able to find those keys in the Git logs. So I decided to, um, to do a little test and I committed those, uh, my uh, real AWS access keys to the GitHub. And in around a minute, I received uh, the, the notification letter from AWS. So the mechanism here is uh, the following. Once you committed your keys or any kind of well-known secret to the GitHub, then the GitHub uh, secret scanning service is um, finding the secret then notifies the provider, in this case AWS, and then the provider, the AWS, is then sending you um, a notification. And in around six minutes, uh, uh, after passing the six minutes, I found that uh, there are first attempts of um, using my AWS access keys. But what was interesting to me uh, was that it is pretty long time if we are talking about the bots which are constantly scanning the uh, all the github repositories what was also interesting to me uh, was that i found that um, aws not only sent the notification letter to me that my keys are compromised but also automatically added the AWS compromised key quarantine policy. This policy, as you can see, is generally uh, denying some dangerous actions. Of course, not all of them, but this is definitely a good step, good, good work um, done by AWS. What was also interesting to me was that in the email I received from uh, AWS was not only about the um, notification that, uh, hey, your keys were compromised, but also an information that, um, further information that 
hey, uh, we can see that there were three instances launched in your uh, in your region. So I was confused. Hey, how do you know that? So what what AWS is doing is um, is that they automatically open a support ticket uh, for your case of compromising the keys. So um, the AWS engineer who was resolving this ticket um, analyzed if the if there is a, uh, you know any um, dangerous actions taken in my uh, account to protect me. Once I uh, analyzed the cloud trail logs, this is by the way the way if you want to see the logs in the terminal that's the um, that's the uh, command and I filtered um, what actions were taken by Amazon support so yeah you can find it in the um, in the cloud trail as well I also found the um, the answer why it was so long why the bots uh, take so long to uh, to find my keys in the public repository uh, well the, the the thing is that github by default delays um, the, the feeds uh, by five minutes okay so once you publish something um, to the github repository then it will be available publicly um, for anyone after five minutes okay so the the, the uh, you will be able after five minutes uh, the bots will detect you your um, you know your uh, public secret so in general you have five minutes for taking some uh, action and remove those uh, keys from the public repository another um, technique which in my opinion uh, is uh, very commonly known is exposing the vulnerable resource um, by the by the vulnerable resource I mean uh, that there's for example the web application which is hosted on the EC2 instance this application is vulnerable to server-side uh, request forgery or the re uh, remote code execution or for example unintended proxy because all those vulnerabilities allow the attacker to reach the instance profile keys which are stored in the EC2 me metadata now if you are uh, if you are new to the concept of metadata you don't know why the keys are in the instance profile and generally this technique is new to you then I encourage you to uh, to watch my previous presentation when I talk about it much more if you want to read more about the um, uh, probably the most um, the most known uh, public example of uh, such attacks was the Capital One breach where the attacker was um, using this technique to, to compromise uh, data of uh, many uh, Capital One users. So now let's talk about the non-obvious methods of breaking into the cloud. In general, just, just think about it. Uh, can you be attacked if you don't have any publicly exposed resources? Um, if you don't use IAM users, so there's no this risk of you know committing uh, the, the long-term uh, access keys um, because you are using only IAM roles, so uh, those keys are just um, tempo uh, temporary. And finally, you, you constantly scan the infrastructure against um, any misconfigurations. So now, what do you think? Can you be still attacked? Well, in my opinion, yes. And here I will show you why. The main reason is 
because we trust people in cyber world. Maybe not people, but uh, the, the work we can find in the internet. So let me show you it on, on the example. Um, some time ago, I, I had the following problem uh, that uh, I was looking for a solution that will automatically uh, rename the, the file which is uploaded to S3 bucket. Okay, so there should be the uh, up, uh, once a user uploads um, any file to S3 bucket, then it triggers uh, an event, an event triggers the uh, Lambda, uh, invokes Lambda and then Lambda uh, modifies the, the file with the, uh, adds the prefix and then the file is landing in the new file is um, overwritten the, the old one. So um, as a typical um, developer um, or um, rather beginner, um, I tried to find the uh, the ready-to-work solution in the internet okay so many people are doing it that uh, we are looking for uh, the solution in Stack Overflow uh, maybe for working um, method in the NPM package but I couldn't find anything so what I did I created my own package which I called the S3 rename I put some, um, you know, some basic information about its usage. And uh, after more than a month, there was th there, there were uh, more than 500 downloads of this package. I didn't announce it anywhere, just uploaded it to the um, to the NPM JS repository. So here's the uh, proof of concept uh, how how does it, uh, how it works? So uh, here in the um, in my lambda, I used the uh, my S3 rename package, and the S3 rename package takes as an argument uh, the source uh, source bucket, so where the the file is from the uh, event file which invokes this lambda. And then the, the uh, name of the old file and uh, creates the uh, new name of this file. And after, after that, I was able to see that uh, after uploading the test new PNG file, there is the uh, prefix is added. In logs, you don't see any, uh, any, anything um, um, spectacular, just a, just some information about starting and ending the Lambda function. However, what I didn't tell you is uh, the fact that to the S3 rename package, I put this, obfuscate, this line of obfuscated JavaScript code. And uh, after the obfuscation, uh, this code is basically uh, looking for AWS access key ID among the environment variables um, because the Lambda function stores the, the access keys of the role which is attached to the Lambda function in the uh, environmental variables. Then if the, so this package, when, uh, when you are running the S3 rename function, then uh, first, first of all, uh, this um, part of code is executed. So it looks for the AWS access key ID. And if there is such AWS access key ID, then please send it to my uh, server and put it as the key parameter. And then after that, I was able to see uh, the uh, AWS access key ID uh, on my server. Now, what was interesting uh, was that there was around 50 uh, of, um, of the uh, attempts to, to um, access my server. Um, what means that people were 
there, there was the AWS access key ID uh, environment variable and people were blindly using my package. Now, the idea of, of that uh, is, isn't new. So here I, I want to share with you the research about typo squatting. In general, um, a researcher w created the, this similar um, approach, but on much broader scale. So the researcher created uh, the, a lot of packages which are very similar to the um, uh, widely used ones. So for example, instead of coffee, uh, there was, uh, um, there was uh, coffee with just one letter E. Those typos are, um, are happen and this is normal, everybody is doing mistakes. So once uh, this, uh, the, the researcher created multiple packages uh, which are in the name, which are very similar to the original ones. And after, after some time, it, he was able to catch more than 17,000 of unique hosts. Okay, so there were multiple, um, multiple um, people, multiple companies um, run those, uh, those maybe not malicious, but those packages prepared by the, um, by the researcher. Now, this is, this is not the only research uh, that was made about it. Uh, here I want to share with you something uh, quite new uh, from this year that uh, one researcher named the NPM package as a dash. Okay, that was the name of the, um, of the package. It is possible in, in, in NPM. Uh, and there was uh, more than seven, uh, 700,000 downloads. And uh, probably the reason of that is uh, that when you put a space um, in put a space um, between dash space and um, some some uh, parameter. So, for example, instead of uh, putting dash and uh, some some flag, then you uh, by a mistake put a sp uh, press space, and that was installing the dash package. It's um, interesting how many how many people were did the same mistake. Now, another very interesting um, class of attack um, that is related with dependencies is the dependency confusion. So the researcher um, did a similar job, but this time only um, trying to uh, only focused on the um, internal packages. Okay, so the packages which are not um, in the uh, public npm js repository, but the uh, internal uh, package that is created, for example, used only by Microsoft. So Microsoft has um, their own um, private internal package uh, repository. So it was also possible that uh, when creating those um, packages with typos, uh, engineers in Microsoft, Apple, and many you know many big companies, they were doing also those mi those mistakes. So they were downloading the uh, packages uh, from the uh, because it couldn't be found in the internal package repository, then it was downloaded from the uh, public uh, repository. So the, the, the code from the researcher was invoked uh, in inside of Apple, Microsoft and other big companies uh, networks. So now uh, let's move on to more AWS related stuff. First of all, uh, what I thought about not only running the, the code, but um, how it can be, um, how an attacker can 
put the the malicious um, malicious code not only in the um, packages but for example in the community AMI so when you are creating the uh, EC2 instance of course you have to specify the Amazon machine image and uh, I have the, the uh, one project which was related with uh, uh, running the Apache guacamole so I was trying to find already pre-configured Apache guacamole now as you can see um, there were uh, like nine images available in the marketplace and almost 100 among the community AMIs the difference is that those in community AMI can be uh, republished by anyone and there is no any additional fee regarding it however if with uh, in the AWS marketplace there are additional charges so many people decide to use the community AMI however the, the difference is uh, not only in money but if the AMI is pushed to the AWS marketplace then this uh, AMI is scanned by AWS those AMIs in community AMI, a community AMI are not. So here's for example, here's an example uh, that one company uh, realized after five years that they are running uh, the AMI with working a uh, cryptocurrency mi uh, crypto miner. And so it was interesting that they, they found it after five years only because of that that they compared that the speed the performance of the, this particular instance was much lower than um, than uh, performance of other instances so this is again this is great way uh, how an attacker can um, you know put any code in the uh, in the AMI another example is the uh, application um, serverless application repository so if you are if you are familiar with the um, uh, vulnerable uh, with the vulnerable serverless application uh, then you probably know the serverless goat so this is a great open source project to learn the, the how to hack serverless applications the problem is that anyone can um, can publish the, the project and put it in the um, in the uh, serverless application repository and here is is such example all of those four uh, uh, applications are uh, released by different uh, accounts okay different AWS accounts only one of it uh, was released by the original authors of the serverless goat however this project is no longer maintained so in um, in consequence this uh, the, the uh, node node.js runtime environment is deprecated uh, so it doesn't work it it works no longer so the solution and it was reported in the issues on the github repository uh, and the solution was hey just you know type in the uh, choose the appsec serverless code and this is the working version because somebody you know fixed it and published it but the same thing could be you know done by anyone so the the attacker can you know publish the uh, any kind of serverless application you can name it as you want all of them has the same you know uh, the same description and then people are running it um, in their hope so uh, sandbox environments another thing I want to um, um, I want to, to, to pay attention uh, to another thing which is the uh, IAM roles very often when I was doing the uh, security assessment uh, and I was reviewing the the roles the trust policy of the roles 
then the, the role could be uh, assumed by multiple accounts. And uh, usually it took a couple of days um, for administrators to, uh, to find who is the owner of this, you know, this account ID. Usually it was the third party. Um, so the, the third party, you know, because they, they, uh, they are integrated uh, with, uh, with the internal solutions. So, the, so they, they need the access. Okay, so for let's say the uh, third party, which is responsible for um, reviewing your cloud trail logs, then they need access to your, um, to your, for example, S3 bucket with the logs, and then um, they are doing their job. But very often also, um, in my cases, um, the customer was, after several days found that, okay, we no longer have, uh, we no longer work with this particular uh, third party. Uh, so it only leaves there because somebody forgot to, to remove this access. And I think that this is very common practice. There is even a research about it and the results are really astonishing. So a lot of companies uh, which work with third parties, which is normal and of course, um, typical, but those third parties very often asks for the too much, um, too, too big privileges. So here, I, I don't want to, you know, name who is the, the owner of this recommendation, but it was found uh, on the website of the third party and uh, they um, they wrote the documentation how to integrate their solution uh, with uh, your AWS solution. So in their documentation, there was something like that, that recommended way to grant access to this third party was to create the, the role with the read only access. For those who are familiar with um, IAM policies knows that read only access grants you read access to almost all um, AWS services. So uh, it is and, and the third party required only the read access to one S3 bucket. And usually um, that's, that's the problem that companies, uh, the, those third parties, have access, read access to a lot of confidential data. So this is, this is why I believe that uh, the, the SolarWinds, uh, the cloud version of the SolarWinds attack is just a matter of, of time. Because now think about it, that um, attackers will compromise uh, one of the S, uh, one of the you know, third party uh, provider and then have access to a lot of their customers. Okay, so now let's talk about the privilege escalation. So assuming that the attacker is able um, to, to get initial access to your cloud. Now, how it is possible to escalate the privileges? So the most known, the most commonly known um, research about it is uh, done by, uh, uh, by Rhino Security Labs uh, and by Spencer Gitson. Uh, and there are defined uh, permissions which are uh, very dangerous in the hands of attacker. What means that uh, if you, for example, have the permission of compromised account has the permission to run instance as well as the IAM pass role, then you can run the EC2 instance and pass the um, privileged role to this instance. And then from, the, uh, from this uh, newly created instance, you can do actions with the permissions of this privileged role. Okay, 
But this is this is something what we, uh, what the community and what people are already familiar. I hope so. Uh, but let's talk about the non-obvious methods of escalating privileges. So um, the first the first thing you have to understand is um, when you are when a user or any kind of identity uh, wants to assume a role, the IAM role, then um, there is need to be a permission or in the trust. Uh, trust policy of the IAM role so that yes this particular user can assume a role can assume this particular role as well as the identity the IAM user needs to have the permission to assume role okay so in so in other words the user need to have permission and the uh, IEM role need to also allow that this particular user will um, will be allowed to assume the role. At least this is what we believe how it works. Because in fact, there are cases where you don't need the assume role to assume role. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but take a look. Here is the example of two very similar um, trust policies. Okay, so in this, uh, this is. Uh, by the way, this is also very interesting that you can, as you can see, uh, there is the root uh, in the AWS principle, but it doesn't mean that only root can assume this uh, this role, but any user in this AWS account is is allowed to uh, assume this role. This is very, very common. However, on the other, on the other side, we have the um, trust policy, which allows to access anyone. However, there's the condition that the principal account need to be the following. So at the first glance, it looks like those two uh, two trust policies can do exactly are you know they are the same but the problem is that sorry <laughs> but the problem is uh, that they are not the same because when you are using the um, wildcard in the principle then the user doesn't have to doesn't need to have this assume role because it is granted by the trust policy. Now that may be um, quite um, confusing uh, because when you are using when you are uh, putting the wildcard in the principal uh, section, then the trust policy works like a resource policy, and the resource policy can grant a permission to the identity. What means uh, if we take, for example, um, the, 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 the following trust policy was very often, uh, well, very often can be found in the uh, accounts which uses multiple AWS accounts, for example, in the AWS organizations. It was quite common and I think is still quite common because even on the um, official AWS uh, security blog, it was uh, presented as an example um, to, to how to create the role for every AWS account, which is in this particular organization. Uh, as you can see, it is now I'm referring to the uh, web archive because um, after publishing um, my finding, and then it was removed from the official um, blog, which of course is very good. But that's not the only way how you can find this strange behavior in the, uh, in the trust policy. If you put um, not only wildcard, but for example, the, uh, the resource number of the role in the trust policy, then this role doesn't need to have 
the, the SDS assume role permission. Okay, so I know that it may sound confusing, so let me uh, show it uh, on the on the uh, little example. Uh, here will be the demo uh, that uh, let's say the attacker was able to compromise the unprivileged IAM user. Uh, and then this user, because there is the um, trust policy uh, with the wildcard, then this comp uh, unprivileged IAM user is granted with the assume role from the trust policy. Uh, and then there is a uh, principal uh, ID in the, um, of other role, privileged role. There is a reference from this maintenance unprivileged role. And then in this way, uh, the attacker will become the administrator. Okay, let me show you uh, how does it work. So here we have the uh, compromised user. As you can see, this user has no permissions. Absolutely cannot do anything, okay? There's no policy attached to it. There is also the maintenance role. And this maintenance role only have the read-only access and the trust relationship is, as you can see, there is the wildcard in the principle and it is limited only to accounts in this particular organization. So, uh, now, because I have this compromised user, so here uh, I'm uh, configured the, the uh, access keys of compromised user, uh, all the identities are allowed to uh, run the STS get caller identity, even if you don't have any permissions, as you can see. Now, I still don't, this compromised user has no permissions at all, but I can uh, assume role uh, in the console and that grants me uh, the uh, temporary access keys of the, uh, as well as the session token, uh, to the maintenance role. So now I can uh, configure another profile in my terminal using those, uh, those temporary, uh, temporary credentials. So AWS access key ID, secret access key, and then I have to also specify the session token, which can be done using the AWS configure set command and then session token, uh, and then just copy paste the session token. And of course, uh, in the name of profile maintenance role. So now let's take a look if we are, uh, if everything works well. So now we are running the STS get caller identity, but using the profile maintenance role, which we uh, configured uh, a moment ago. Okay, as you can see, we, I can run the, the now all actions as the maintenance role. But on the same account, there is also the admin role. And if we take a look on the trust relationship of the admin role, you can see that the, the principle is um, the role maintenance role. Okay, so now if I'm using the maintenance role, as you remember, maintenance role had only permissions, uh, the, the read only permissions. There's no STS assume role permission to this role. However, I'm allowed to assume the admin role because in the principle there is uh, the direct reference to, to this IAM role. Now, for me, it is, uh, it is a big problem of inconsistency. Um, I reported it to, to AWS, uh, I talked with, with them. Um, so I believe that soon there will be uh, released some, um, some official solution to it, uh, but now it works as it, as it is. 
All right, so now, assuming that our attacker was able to get initial access and then escalate privileges, then there's another problem of exfiltrating data. Of course, once you have the access to this, um, to this um, compromised AWS account, then you can exfiltrate data using multiple ways. Uh, like, for example, uh, pushing all this uh, sensitive stuff to, to uh, your own S3 uh, bucket, um, or just um, doing the, the snapshot of the RDS instance and then uh, sharing it with uh, the attacker's account. A lot of ways how to do it, but, um, but all of those actions are logged by the AWS CloudTrail or at least uh, VPC flow logs uh, detects all those uh, actions of exfiltration. However, uh, what is lesser known method is that you can steal the data which will not be um, mon which will not be detected by all those monitoring or logging uh, services. Okay, let me explain it. By default, in every VPC DNS, uh, in every VPS, uh, VPC, sorry, DNS resolution is enabled by default. What means that once you uh, spin up the new EC2 instance uh, in your VPC and you are uh, write the command uh, ping um, amazon.com, then the, the amazon.com name will be uh, automatically resolved. And what people are not aware is that uh, in the documentation of um, a VPC, you can find that the traffic to or from Amazon DNS server um, will not be um, filtered by the network ACLs, the access control lists, or the security groups. Furthermore, even in the uh, VPC flow logs, you can see that the, the traffic generated by instances when they contact the Amazon DNS server is not logged at all. Okay, let me, let me show you uh, on the, the following um, example. So, here I have the uh, EC2 instance, which is in the private subnet, and the private subnet has no, should have no uh, connection to the internet. Let's say there is also um, any any egress traffic is is blocked using the uh, security group and network access control lists. So when I run on this, being on this, um, having the session to this EC2 instance. And when I run the command uh, ping, here's the some base64 uh, secret, encoded secret, and here is my domain name, which, uh, which I control. Um, and the, 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 this command, of course, will not um, give any ICMP response. However, on, the, uh, on my... Mm, uh, DNS server uh, logs, I can see that this, uh, this name was tried to resolve. So in this way, I can see that the, uh, this Base64 encoded secret on my uh, Zhebski.com DNS server. So you can do, uh, you can go even uh, a step further and create a reverse shell over DNS. So, as you can see, I used the DNS cat uh, 2 uh, and I was able to, to uh, get the reverse shell to such um, isolated EC2 instance, which shouldn't have any access. Um, how, if you want to uh, repeat this, uh, like do it by yourself, uh, then uh, you can run uh, my version of the DNS cat 2 uh, because this uh, the official one DNS cat 2 uh, is no longer maintained. 
the good news is when when I was doing you know the the um, the, the single queries to my Zhebski.com domain, it wasn't detected by by any service. However, once I run the, uh, the, the reverse shell over DNS, then the AWS guard duty uh, detected it. So that is definitely um, a good news. So um, it will be, so only when the high volume in the DNS is, is sent, then guard duty will help you. Um, however, it, it requires uh, further um, investigation. Uh, what does it mean the high volume and to what limit you can still uh, send data over DNS and being undetected. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the defense. Uh, so in this year, at the end of March, uh, in this year, uh, there was announced the Route 53 uh, Resolver DNS Firewall. And this is the, the server, uh, the service which is designed to help you um, to uh, basically to, to uh, fix this, this gap in the DNS traffic. It allows you to allow, block or alert uh, in any case, any uh, you know, any queries to uh, using the DNS uh, protocol. So, for example, here I'm uh, I want to see in my uh, CloudWatch log stream. I want to see all the query, all the DNS queries that are uh, sent. And thanks to Route 53 Resolver DNS Firewall, you can now see this DNS traffic. You can also uh, block or allow. So for example, only the uh, traffic to some domain is allowed or um, traffic to some domain is blocked. Um, and what about other um, mitigations? then um, I would recommend you to, to, uh, to reviewing uh, your um, trust policies. If you are using, of course, third parties um, and review the, the permissions they have and to, to verify, do they really need such broad uh, permissions? Um, audit your current trust policies because uh, it may be uh, pretty common that you some AWS account uh, from the old projects um, or um, f from third parties which you no longer use, they still have access to your roles, directly to your roles. Um, there is also a, a, a interesting service which is called the IAM Access Analyzer which will show you uh, uh, who uh, from the who externally accessed your uh, resources, and finally for reviewing permissions, um, I find very helpful cloud explaining. So I also uh, put it here. Uh, this is the the open source tool uh, made by Sal Salesforce. I think this is very uh, very nice tool, and uh, yeah, I hope it will uh, it will be helpful for you. Uh, regarding the, the dependency confusion, um, my only um, the recommendation would be that uh, to use only trusted resources. I know that it sounds very uh, generic, but um, but doing a protection from such attacks um, is not trivial and depends on multiple factors. Um, so there's no one good general solution except this to only use trusted resources all right uh, that's all of my presentation uh, i hope you learned something new um, that uh, those methods um, were not for you uh, so obvious so commonly known um, if they were then please let me know uh, please let me know what do you think about the uh, the presentation. 
Uh, and uh, also now I'm waiting for any questions. You can find me on the Discord. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk and uh, enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you very much.